everything we say can and certainly will be held against us. Yes. Yeah, shit. You're probably going to be good. Um, you're about to we, mouth off, that means. How are we? God, your sound quality is shite. You just sound like, hello, operator, may I make a long distance international call, please? <laughs> From 1980. <laughs> <clears throat> operator. Um, that's a song, right? From the 60s? Uh, the only version I know is Manhattan Transfer. Give me uh, no, information. No, there's a song uh, that, where they say operator. And then there's also the one with the Jim Croce. Um, yep. Yeah. I'm thinking of the Manhattan Transfer one, which is the gospel one. There's some other one. I'd like to speak to a friend of mine. She's trying to call. Prayer is the number. Faith is the exchange. Every time I dial it, Jay uses what's the name. Operator. Operator. We're not using that for the record. <laughs> you do not right. have my permission to use that. Um, okay, so we're going to start this episode with a very serious opening. Oh. I'm a very serious sort of guy. <laughs> I think we just did start the episode. I think it's a perfect way of starting it. What you guys don't see behind the scenes on the Carmudgeon Show is Derek and me trying to figure out how we're going to start the episode. Should we be serious? Should we sing a song? Should we just... We pre- never sing a song. <laughs> you sing a song. I think you did once. I think you did once. That's true. Anyway, it's been so long. Welcome back. This is another uh, episode of The Carmudgeon Show. I am Jason Adam Sandler. Hold on. I forgot my name. Jason Discount Sandler, Camisa, and this is Derek Tam hyphen Scott. Um, mm. And it's been a long time because oh, Derek... Oh, when we were off air, remind me to tell you something. <laughs> not, not on the episode. You can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that. What happened to you? Who was me? Nothing. To you? Point to a doll where they hurt you. Um <laughs> <laughs> that is so mean. I love it. First of all, and now I'm tempted to say, let's pause video and you can tell me what it is. <laughs> um, uh, it's I, not that exciting. It relates to hyphens. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I just, I, I just w- wish to know that one day your parents approve of your hyphen nickname. And like the first time your mom is like, Hey, hyphen, it's me. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I will, I will never stop laughing. I told you my car calls me hyphen because when it asked to, for the car to be to, what my name was, I told it was hyphen. That's so good. So it says hello hyphen when I turn the e golf on. Does it say like uh, hyphens e golf on your on your uh, or hyphens e hyphen golf? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now every car mudgeon episode starts with an uh, with an update on e golf uh, update. It's like Speaking the Dacia with. Sandero. Speaking of which, uh, today Dacia announced a new Sundera. My e-golf is it currently comes with not... ABS. <laughs> right, and Windows! Uh, my e-golf came with an oil leak, and it is now mm. at the dealership. At um, no additional charge. Well, it's under warranty, which is nice. I mean... Well, I mean, the oil, oh, you, the oil leak yeah. was free. You it came standard with this particular... It. It's funny, the other one... So this is my second e-golf, for those who don't keep track of my e-golf. side of 2016, leased it, and then I bought it 2019 at the end of the lease because I just can't live without an e-golf. Um, this one, I think it was only about a month old, um, and I was under the hood with a friend, and he's like, why is, your, why is there a little bit of oil? And so there's a, there's a belly pan, and it's got like an um, absorbent mat on it, probably for sound, um, and it had oil on it and I smelled it, it smelled like hypoid. I'm like, eh, it's probably just something in the build, you know, in the build process or whatever. But every time I've looked under the hood, which is four times at this point, um, it, uh, I think there's probably I, four times as many as I have. Oh, I think I checked is... to see that there was a motor there when I first bought it and I haven't opened it yep. since. Click. <laughs> yeah. Um, but every time I've looked, there's, there's a little bit of transmission fluid, um, like that's clearly sprayed out of, there's a vent tube. So there's a transmission vent and a tube that goes all the way to the very top of the sort of motor compartment. Um, and it's always had a little bit of residue on it. And it's just leaked a bit. And then a couple of times I've looked down and there's some like oil sitting on the belly pan. Well, it's now enough that it's staining my driveway. And I, I don't mind an oil leak. I really don't care. The problem is, this is the one fucking car that's not supposed to stay in my goddamn driveway. Like, all the other leaky piles of shit are in my, in my garage, which is a painted floor. And the reason for the painted floor is so you go and wipe up all the disgusting amounts of oil that they leak everywhere. Ferrari especially. This thing is leaking on my driveway. Not acceptable. 
Yeah, especially for something this new. Uh, well, I guess the the intrigue is going to deepen, uh, and eventually we'll have an answer. Uh, yeah, I suspect it was probably just overfilled with fluid at the dealership or at the factory. Um, although I don't quite understand why it would be getting worse and not better. Um, my initial thought was perhaps it was the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires on it that now uh, enable it to Allow generate to 1.06 do. G of cornering yes. force. <laughs> But I just, I did a drive the other day where I was hypermiling, just kind of driving completely normally, and I came back and it made a big puddle. Not a I big mean, maybe puddle. Maybe that was a residual coming out of, of your belly pan. It could, but the last, I'll be honest, the last probably 100 miles I've put on the car have been very mild gentle. and gentle and not doing anything bad. And certainly no cornering. Like, I'm just in town, um, and it's starting to get worse. So I don't know what could be pressurizing my transmission um, other than... Hot know. air from you. Okay. Thank you. Tune in next month for a year for another episode of the Core Show. This has been great. Goodbye. See you. Um, I love, I said to Derek offline, I love how clean my desk looks. This is a complete fucking lie. I basically have nowhere. I'm holding this pencil because there's nowhere to put it. I have stuff piled everywhere. This is really bad. This is what happens when you don't do a Core Show in months. Chaos. Um, perhaps at the opposite end of the spectrum from electric golfs would be McLaren hypercars. Does that work as a transition? Was no. The no, 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 because that would insinuate that, that McLarens are amazing and the e-golf is not. Uh, so how the hell are we going to make that trans- transition? So you want to talk about a McLaren F1, don't you? Because you're a rat bastard and you got a ride in one? Did you... I do not have enough zeros associated with my name to be allowed to drive one. Come on, there's not enough insurance? I mean, you made a video on the damn thing. Like, surely, and I'm calling you surely, surely, comma, someone has given you an insurance policy. That sucks that you didn't get to drive it. Um, uh, I'll experience one again at some point in the future. We'll see. I will say whoever happen. was driving the car was certainly not shy about spinning tire and redlining, and that was yes. really nice to see. yes. He was a cool guy. He's just like, it's just a car. So, you know. It's a car that's worth more than most wealthy neighborhoods. <laughs> that's true. Um, uh, which is a relatively recent thing. But I think fully justified. I mean, I'm, I, at the end of the video, I said something like, the car is worth it, ultimately. I mean, which I think it is. There's nothing... It's so singular, right? The reason why things end up valuable is because there's not there's no substitute for them, like in the economic Saying, sense. Of course, Porsche boy is like there is no substitute. <laughs> that just snuck into my lexicon, and I hardly even knew that I was doing such a thing. Shut up! Sorry. Um, he just bought. I, by the way, he now has two nine eleven. So I'm making fun of him for the record. Mm-hmm. As he. Derek, I'm talking to the audience about you. Look at him blinking. That's the guilty blink. Oh, 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 he's outed me for two, two 9-11s. And by the way, I just got an email from somebody who works at Porsche's R&D Center. And they were like, we love you even though you hate old 9-11s. I don't hate old 9-11s. I love 9-11s. The problem with a 9-11 is it's so goddamn good that it makes everything else look bad and then just becomes an obvious choice. And I just want people to experience terrible things because misery loves company. You know, old 9-11s are not objectively good, and that's why I like them. I disagree. They are reliable. They're comfortable. I mean, you've got to think back to when those, you know, think about what else was out in the 1950s. Were you going to drive cross-country in an MGB? No. Uh, I guess I mean, like, sort of dynamically. Right, the way that the car behaves at the limit, it's not a friendly, accessible car. It's a car for an advanced driver. And by the same token, like ergonomically, like you get, especially when the architecture was getting elderly, like in the '90s, and you're like, oh, so the the power the car's power mirrors because it costs seventy thousand dollars new, but the switch for the the joystick to position the mirrors on the top of the door, um, just you know, by the quarter window, but the switch that controls whether you're doing the left or right mirror is underneath the dash. And it's unmarked. And it's just a rocker switch. And, like, that's the ergonomic state of things. And it's like the windshield wiper on-off switch is on a column, but the, the delay is a knob on the dashboard. Which they did that stupid like, thing for 996s, too, 
Which but is... like, there's just a lot of stuff where you're like, this makes no sense. Like, objectively, it's not good. But that's what makes it sort of interesting. And I don't notice that stuff anymore. But when you think about it as an outsider, you're like, well, this is really stupid. Like, or like the HVAC in the 80s when they added air conditioning. And so there's like three different switch panels. And then there's like a master lever between the seats, which opens and closes the heater boxes. And so the HVAC controls are distributed in three different locations, ranging from like the dashboard to the center console to the floor between the seats. Like, no exaggeration. This is the kind of stuff that I, that I have to explain to people when I'm talking about Mark 1 Volkswagens. Because the, the Mark 1 VWs that I have are at the very end of a 20-year run. Um, and I, you know, I start out by saying, look, A1. This platform is called A1, and it's for a reason. There was the original, there was a Type 1 in 1940-whatever. And then there was an A1 in 1974. This is Volkswagen's first ever from the ground up car. And they were after the Beetle, obviously, and they, they started over and then had to add a whole bunch of crap to the, these engines, like like 16-valve heads later on, five-speed in the transmission, like fifth gear in the transmission, air conditioning, power steering, all the stuff that was never originally done, and it's all tacked onto the car in, in, in the engine compartment in the most inelegant way possible. And the, yeah, because that's what like, we have to get, put it in. <laughs> yeah, and they're not going to redesign the way the engine mounts just because now we need a fifth gear. So they like literally the, the fifth gear on Volkswagen's early O2 transmissions, which were in production until the '90s, was a separate casing. So they had the four-speed case, and there's just a fifth gear cap on it, and you can pull that right off and swap the fifth gear out. It doesn't even interact with the other gears, basically. Um, and it's the same thing with 911s. I mean, that's the the result of co continual evolution is that you have these weird things, like for example, your 964's exclamation mark button. Like, mm -hmm. is this like a good time button? I'm gonna hit this and be like, yeah, this is great. What a weird thing. Uh, oh. Yeah, and that was their effort to modernize it. They're like, we're going to add electronics to this car. So now there's an exclamation button and, and light that comes on. Which where it's just like, extinguishes another exclamation mark. Well, yes, if it like, wants you to be aware of something, like, they're, this is when they're early computers. They're like, what do we use computers for cars in? I don't know. Let's use it to tell the driver things, such as when you're out of fuel, because, you know, a light, a, a gas light's not enough, or something like that. But yes, there's a lot of weird stuff Love in it. those cars. Uh, so when um, you say that they're good cars, I'm like, mm, they're kind of good in some senses, but they're also kind of... I think 911's got a really bad reputation. I mean, the whole Widowmaker thing, I get. But I have now driven a whole bunch of early 911s, um, in, and some in quite some anger. Um, I did drive every generation of 911 at Weissach, which is you know uh, Porsche's test facility, on snow tires, um, which really was a wonderful experience. Because, first of all, Weissach is lines, lined with walls. So you mess up anything, and you're smashing into a wall. Um, but the cars were just so incredibly progressive and so wonderful and the speeds were so low on those snow tires that I really got to feel what, what those cars do. And I think that they, you're right, they're, they're wonderful tools for experts. Um, they can bite you if you don't know what you're doing, but if you don't know what you're doing, you shouldn't be buying a freaking sports car. Um, which Doesn't actually is the perfect transition into what we do want to talk about. <laughs> um, I just, Your love I, I of love modern McLarens? Them. Our, res our mutual love f of modern McLarens. Do we, though? Oh, God, no. Okay. <laughs> I actually, I, that, I'm glad we're, we're getting to this point. Because even though I think we both, I've never even sat in a moving, running McLaren F1. I think that's just kind of the best sports car of all time without having even driven one. Um, and I sort of have this inherent, it's not a hatred, but it's a lack of a, give a fuck about modern McLarens until I drive one. And then I'm like, oh man, I, they're, they're so good, most of them. And then I get out of it and I'm like, that was amazing, don't care. And I just, I, I have a dissonance about this. I feel like I should like them more, but I don't know if it's because of the people who tend to buy them or the reasons those people tend to buy them or just the fact that it's got a horribly port injected turbocharged engine and a dual clutch that it's I not flawed remember. enough. Oh, <gasps> from someone who owns a 911 saying that the reason you don't like modern McLarens is because they're not flawed enough. I mean, I just went through a litany of reasons why the 911 is flawed, right? It's got lots of character and weird stuff to it. 
Um, I don't know. For me, sound is a really important part of a car. Um, and let me see if I've... Uh, the cars that I've sold and not really enjoyed invariably were cars that I didn't like the way they sounded. Like, my 968 was like that. Very good car. I just didn't like the way it sounded, and I never really enjoyed it. I replaced it with a 996 with an exhaust system because it sounded better. Um... That was kind of the only reason. Uh, I think so. Yeah, that checks I think out. It sounded, yeah. uh, so I don't like the way the modern McLarens sound. They're very good objectively, but a little too easy. It's too accessible. That's what I mean when I say it's good. It's it's it is no more difficult to drive one of those cars than it is to drive uh, a Camry. Uh, and for someone who, you know, like you were you were just you used the expert idea to transition into this topic. For someone who's not an expert, that's really nice because you get in this thing and it's it feels instinctive and it's really competent and it's easy to go fast and uh, that's all great, especially if you don't have a lot of experience, uh, especially on the street. You know, on the racetrack, I think the story is a little bit different. Like I drove a Senna yesterday and that car continues to alarm me in a way that I <laughs> makes me like it more than any other modern McLaren I've driven because it's scary. Uh, I just want to feel something. Um, but... But with other modern McLarens, it's like I feel it feels fast, but it's sort of easy and competent and good. And for a, someone who's relatively novel, I think that that's really nice. Uh, but I would rather have some experience where it takes a little bit of work and finesse, and that's fundamentally what draws me to old cars. And I think the the F1 does have that, and that's part of the appeal. Uh, that also coupled with just information. I always feel like I'm not getting enough information when I drive a modern car. Uh, and that and that sort of quietness is eerie to me. It's scary. And maybe this is from someone who spent a lot of time driving air-cooled 911s. Because air-cooled 911s, between what you get through the seat of your pants and what you get through the steering wheel, like, I know a lot about what's happening when I'm driving one of those cars. And modern cars, I always feel like I, I'm, it, I, I'm, it's, I've gone deaf. Right. And I don't have the input. The, the, like, sensory I, so input that's, to it's interesting what's that happening. you feel that way about McLarens because I think of the modern breed of supercar, they are by far and away, uh, short of a, a 911 GT3, um, they're by far and away the most communicative. Um, not, GT3 is behind it, right? McLaren still uses hydraulic steering. And it, not only is it hydraulic, it's one of the best setups I've ever, one of the most talkative steering setups I've ever, um, ever felt. The thing about McLarens is they tend to bite. So they like to, they snap oversteer on corner entry, which, so, you know, you think you got it, like everything's great. And then you just turn in a little bit too quickly and the car snaps out and, um, uh, you know, they, they'll sort of bite you at inopportune times. But when you're driving down the road, you sort of feel everything you need to feel. Um, and you, I can compare that to, I just, I just spent a week or three days with a Ferrari Roma. Um, and that's kind of car. important. How was that? There's a there's a revelations coming out about that, but I didn't even talk about the, the car itself. I basically did the whole episode and never talked about like I never reviewed the car. I I, I did that in voiceover at the end. Um, interesting. It's a great look. It's a great return to the sort of elegant GT style Ferrari that is the car that really made Ferrari what it is. Um, yeah, I'm really keen on the looks. But um, steering's dead, and I mean not not. It's not a terrible e-pass setup. It's not like a 991.1 e-pass Porsche setup, but it's it's not particularly communicative. And the the problem that I have with it is when the car gets sideways, which it does continually, you don't feel any part of it. <clears throat> so typically, a car with with even most modern e-pass cars that are the steering is completely dead. You don't feel any tram lining. You don't feel any road texture. You kind of don't feel anything. The second the back starts to rotate, the steering the steering automatically turns in for you, um, and it's just just a function of the drag on the wheels pulling them toward to sort of steer for you. Um, and I think Porsche had done some experiment. They, one of their engineers had told me years ago they'd done some experiments on E-Pass, and they realized that all they need to do is artificially give you a nudge in the right direction, and most drivers would automatically start to counter steer. So they programmed that into the GT uh, GT cars early on, like 991.1 GT3 will sort of give you a nudge in the right direction to help you. What I found was by the time that, that the Roma does not understeer, it was, it's just steady state oversteer. No matter what you're doing, the back end is loose and Ferrari typically does that and then uses computers to control the rotation. 
and control the cars, which is a kind of a recipe for disaster if you if once you turn everything Fun. off. I, I do not turn things oh. off in modern Ferraris. Um, because you're just you're basically it's like a stealth bomber, right? You can't it's it's meant to be so incredibly loose that the computers can react to control it and ultimately you'll wind up with a car that's even faster and more uh turny. <laughs> a car that can can certainly turn more easily. Oh, you're talking but, about when they in airplanes they make them fundamentally not longitudinally unstable. stable Correct. so that and then they use the computers to keep them under control um because that makes them more responsive and exactly. more agile. So if you Right. If you're dealing with a, you know, if you don't, in the days before stability control, you had to insert understeer into a car because you'd never be able to control it under most situations. And the idea is if it's steady state understeers, in most conditions, it'll understeer or worse, be slightly oversteery. Ferrari just goes full batshit with oversteer um, in the last couple generations of cars. And the problem in this one is it reacts so quickly, it steps out so fast, so easily that um, by the time you correct it by the time you you even process it uh, it you're you're in trouble um and so i had it off i did a couple of spirited maneuvers. acceleration maneuvers um on like a, a big broad street and i got it way more sideways than i thought i'm just the kind of spinning tire grab a gear and then it just goes oh i just dropped my i got so excited that i dropped my thing um it just it just throws itself the other way and you don't feel any of it in the steering mclarens don't do that Modern McLarens are really talkative. Um, I know why you don't like the way that engine sounds, because most of them sound like shit. Um, and you hate flat planes. Um, but they do vibrate the whole cabin. There's this left to right. I don't know if you've noticed in all the McLarens. You're well, sitting at idle and the whole car is shaking left, right? I mean, in the Senna, even more so, because the panels are so <laughs> slim that you leave the car idling yeah. and you can see all the exterior yeah. bodywork vibrating. Right. And I kind of like that about the McLaren. I do too. It's like, it right, has unlike, texture. Right. So many of these modern cars, the chassis is so stiff and the engine is so well isolated that you could be at 1,000 or 6,000. And if you had earplugs in, you'd never know. But McLarens buzz and they fizz and, and you really do feel the engine. You hear it and feel it and then you feel the steering. Um, the driving position is great, whatever. And I just continuously think when I get out of them that I don't care. And all I dream about is, you know, I have a book here on this thing. Um, that we both, <laughs> you and I both bought, and I haven't even cracked it open yet. Um, but I think about that, and I think about the Gordon Murray T50. And, like, did you see the prototype video that came out this past week? No, I saw that it existed, but I didn't want to watch it. So I instead watched watch. one about him talking about the fan for, like, okay. eight minutes. <laughs> the, the, the prototype drive is, it required explanation that they didn't bother giving. So when you, when, you know, this was the first time I think that the car moved under its own power or the first time that Gordon drove the car himself. Um, early on in the development process of a car, you take steps. You don't just, you know, throw the bunch of parts in and you go batch it crazy. So the, the engine was limited to 3000 RPM and he was just there to probably, I'm assuming, test driving position, you know, just some, some, engineering hard points to make sure that they got that right before they move on to the next thing. And I heard some people be like, why well, didn't rev it over three grand? Blah, 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 blah. They were bitching about it. I was drooling the whole time, just like so jealous that he got to even let the clutch out on a 12,000 RPM V12. I just, that car is the modern, it's the, the second coming of the McLaren F1. Well, yeah, and that's always been the intent. And if you watch some of the earlier videos, uh, he's talking about how, like, here are all the things about the F1 that I wished I could have done differently, and I'm doing them differently. Right. Which is so absurd, because you look at the McLaren F1, and you're like, there are so few compromises in this car. I mean, that's what you're paying for with that car, is the absolute lack of compromises. There's no, like, corporate force where it's like, oh, you have to use this motor, or like... Okay, maybe it is a cool motor, but like there's none of that. It's completely clean sheet in every respect, and every decision that is made along the way is to make it the ultimate driver's car. And the opportunity to do something like that in the automotive industry is so rare because you're always dealing with constraints of architecture or suspension design or parts bin this or engine that or you know corporate forces that or, or whatever the, the constraints may be. Right? So one of my common complaints about modern McLarens is that it's like, oh, it's always the same damn you know, 3.8 or 4 liter twin turbocharged V8 in a mid-engine chassis, and they just sort of keep repackaging it and selling it for a decade, <clears throat> which, you know, is clever. Um, well, but that's it. Th so you're totally right. That's my problem with McLaren now, is that how many times can you dupe 
a customer into buying the same friggin' car over and over and over again. They just wrap a different body in it, maybe a little bit more power, maybe it's a 4.0 versus a 3.8, but it's the same engine, it's the same transmission. However, they did start, that MP4-12C was a new engine, roughly based on a Nissan Le Mans engine, but still a new engine, a new gearbox, a new chassis, a new, a new everything with no shared, shared switch gear with any other, any other car. So in theory, they started out correct. So how did it just become... Well, it's expensive to do that. You can't do that with every single car. Oh, you're Especially right. If... But I mean, like, but how did, why did they choose that motor? Like, that's my question. Like, would the, if you can imagine an MP412C <laughs> coming out, and imagine that it had some sort of bespoke V12 or some just genuinely special engine um, and, and, the, and a concentration on the driving experience. Like Mc, McLaren say as a company that they're very much concentrating on the driving experience. And they really must because the cars are brilliant and they haven't gone to E-Pass and they haven't, you know, electric power steering. They haven't done all this other shit. But at the end of the day, I just think F1 is up here and somewhere hovering around zero by comparison are all the modern McLarens, no matter how good they are. And I just can't wrap my, wrap my head around why I just don't give a fuck about them. I mean, I th- well, to answer one of the many questions you just asked and probably one of the less interesting ones, uh, I mean, I think they went with turbocharging because you can easily get more power out of it. Uh, and so they're like in the future, like to future proof this and to come out with ease, uh, with more performance variants with relative ease, right? For a naturally aspirated engine to get 100, 200 more horsepower is very challenging with a turbocharged engine. It's really straightforward. So, right. I mean, I think that's probably the answer to that question. But yes, of course, if we could choose, uh, then yeah, we would do what Gordon Murray has chosen on both occasions when he's had the opportunity, which is a, a naturally aspirated V12. What did the McLaren F1 retail for when it came out? 540,000 sterling. Sterling. So about a million bucks back then. And it was twice as much as pretty much anything else. Okay. Like so including that XJ220 and including XJ220 and EB110. Well, look, there you have it. I mean, that'd be 2 million today and basically that puts it in, you know, more expensive than everything the else. The territory where you buy a car that they make 100 of or 64 mm-hmm. of for the right. road road cars. But so yes. Yeah. It was a sort of open carte blanche. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's the difference. The, the other McLaren models, certainly MP412C did not start out all that expensive. And 570 is certainly not a million bucks. Yes, it is, yes. You know. I mean, it's, a com- it's completely incomparable. And then they've been able to somehow sort of extend that or, you know, the, that, you know, when you're making soup, never mind. <laughs> Um, no, where you have not like never a, mind. You're the gonna concentrate, have to right? There's a concentrate, and you extend it out, or you like you you you, you know, add I mean, water to the bouillon cubes. Is that what you're yes? Saying? Basically, you you extend out the base ingredients to to instead of. Uh, <laughs> this is why you make turkey soup out of a carcass, right? So, senna. <laughs> <laughs> what what does senna have anything to do with turkey soup and a carcass? Do not refer to 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 Ayrton senna as a carcass, by the way. Oh my um, god. <laughs> What I'm saying image, is they took the same torture. basic yeah. ingredients. I know what you're saying, but it's the way you're it saying it. Yeah. Into, into, uh, into a different dish uh, that, that uses the same ingredients <sighs> of Ayrton Senna's carcass. Oh, it's, look, it's the same thing. What is that, what is that French thing where, where you, you make? It's, it's got celery, carrots, and a mirepoix. Mirepoix. Yeah, right. mirepoix. So you're saying they're using the same base ingredients for 7,000 different dishes, and it turns out it's a carrot, a celery, and the carcass of Ayrton and Senna. <laughs> boiled it, That's how Mexican boiled food works, that. too. Mexican food is what? like rice, <laughs> rice, beans, like meat, and cheese, and like some tomatoes. And yeah. then you just end up with like eight different dishes that are all the same damn ingredients. It, it occurred to me, we're, when, we're back at Motor Trend, which I love, I have my Motor Trend on demand uh, hoodie on, which I can't ever wear out in public. Um, the, uh, why did you leave Motor Trend? I'll give you the same answer I give everyone else. People re- leave companies. No, I don't want to know the answer to this number question. One, I was just trying to push your Because buttons. they have another job. And number two, because it sucked to work there. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I did not have another job. Um, no, we were doing Alpina B6 versus uh, BMW M6, both crank coupes. And it occurred to me that I was trying to like, come up with an image for this. And I realized that every Italian dish is the same thing. It's a scam. There's some sort of dough, which is, exists of like flour plus water, 
tomato, cheese, and basil. That's it. That's all you get. Like, you want to... I got to do the New York Italian. You want a manicotti or like a manicotti, manicotti, however you pronounce it? It's the same shit as a... As like pizza, which is the same thing as a bowl of spaghetti. It's all the same shit. It's flour, water, tomato, basil, and cheese. Everything in Italian cooking. There's like cream-based ones. Yeah, but my point is only bacon. Yes, a bowl of yeah. a bowl of spaghetti with tomato sauce is basically pizza deconstructed and reconstructed, and Fair. then squeezed through one of those Play-Doh hair things. You know, remember when we kids? I mean, <laughs> anyway. uh, so that's what I mean. And in an effort to make a volume manufacturer, which McLaren, you know, comparatively is now as to compared to when the F1 was made, like you have to do that kind of stuff. Uh, and it puts certain constraints on that lead to the cars being the way they are versus what you do when you have the T50 or the F1. Right. Uh, and that's why those cars are so magical, I think, is because you're uh, you're basically saying forget all that, forget all the concerns about volume and having to make this be a profitable business entity. We're going to make the most awesome car ever. I, I wonder, and was, it, how often was the F1... Oh, yeah, once in a lifetime, or twice in the case of Gordon Murray. But was, yeah. was the F1 profitable? I think once they started racing. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the course of doing my research, I, I learned that basically in order... Once they started racing because they had all these customer cars that were racing and they were providing factory support for them. And so that's like spares package and, you know, a McLaren truck shows up full of stuff and you pay them some number of dollars for them to, you know, provide you with support. I think that's when the, it ended up making economic sense. And they had intended to sell more of the cars, uh, but the economic climate prevented that from happening, which is funny now because you think about what they're worth now. And what they cost then, and you're like, oh yeah, there's so many people who would buy that thing, but that just wasn't the reality then. There was a supercar craze in the early '90s, and then the bubble burst, and there was economic recession, and blah blah blah. Uh, and so they just did. They sold. They built as many of them as they could sell, but no more. Uh, right. Which uh, you know, but- like there were XJ220s, for example. Even they only made 300 XJ220s or 272, and they sat around unsold for years. Right. Uh, unable to sell them because they built more than they had orders for. And at least McLaren didn't do that and end up with unsold cars sitting around. But that, you know, the true v- volume that they could come up with in basically it was five years um, was was 64 road cars. It's pretty crazy to think about, you know, McLaren only being able to sell 60 something cars. And then you look at the number of cars that Bugatti has sold, which are twice. I mean, they started out, didn't it start out as a million euro um, and at the end, it was four, three, four, five, depending on what yeah, car you Yeah, for all the special editions. Mm-hmm. And I mean, what, they made 300 Veyron Coupes, and did they make the and same 150 number? Convertibles, 150 convertibles, 450 total cars. So now we're in, you know, now that we're in Chiron, I'm sure we're over five, 600 cars. Um, and you think that's 10 times as many cars as McLaren F1. And while the Veyron and all of its derivatives in the Chiron are, are amazingly impressive, there are far too many of them to ever be... Uh, worth, I think, what the F1s are worth, and I don't think they can compare. Again, having well, never driven Even if they had built the same number of them, I think they would be worth considerably different amounts of money. At least to me, they are. Because of the experience? Because of the experience. The ex- they, they are so different experientially to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could not be more diverse. Well, think about that. A Veyron weighs twice what a McLaren F1 weighs. They're 4,400 Are they 4,400? Yeah, and right. the McLaren F1 is like at 1138 kilos or something like that. They're like 24 or 2,500 pounds. Heavy? Wow. I thought they were... Well, that's what's Lewis. Thought... Okay. Yeah, the I target, I think the they were 1060 dry or something like that. That's so crazy. Kilos. That's so crazy, yeah. So, I mean, here you have two cars. One's rear-wheel drive that weighs half as much as the all-wheel drive turbo 16-cylinder. You know, the Veyrons are not loud. They're, they don't make a fantastic noise. They make a cool noise, but it's not a... McLaren it's not noise. spine tingling. No. The McLaren is spine tingling in every sense. Not How loud not is it sense, in the car? Not literally. It's not that loud. So when I, the, at startup inside, and this car also has the MSO exhaust, which is the, the upgraded performance exhaust. The original exhaust for these cars is this massive thing that, you know, Gordon Murray wrote a note to BMW over how heavy it was because he was like, that's not acceptable. Um, right. Weighed like more it, than the engine, right? It was some, I it think was like it, 100 kilos. Yeah, it, it was... Absurd. It weighed twice as much as he wanted it to weigh. Uh, and then so they remade the whole system out of Inconel, and that's how they solved it, which was made the engine cost more than a BMW 750 engine. The exhaust of the McLaren F1 cost more than the entire engine of the, of the 750i. 
Oh, um, wow. And uh, because it was made of ink canal. Uh, so the original muffler is this, it's supposed to be a crash structure. I think it functions as a crash structure uh, in addition to being a muffler, which is very clever McLaren thinking, right? This thing is so, going to be here in the back of the car. It's going to serve this function of making exhaust quiet. And it's in the place where we need it to be to also be a crash structure. Uh, so the the car in, from the video doesn't have that system installed. It comes with it, but it has the MSO, the factory McLaren special operations performance exhaust, which is loud. Um, but at startup inside the car, it's quiet. You, it, you, you don't hear very much. Uh, and then as soon as you're underway, you hear a lot, especially intake noise. <laughs> yeah. uh, you don't, the exhaust noise isn't that pro- prominent inside the car. Outside the car, it's quite prominent. But yeah, a lot of intake noise. Um, so yeah, that was my first impression on startup is, wow, it's pretty quiet actually. And any vibration at all? Mm, I mean, 12s typically don't vibrate. Yeah, not a lot. Um, um and what, why did we start talking about this? Who the hell knows? <laughs> we, <laughs> we were talking about how McLaren's, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm, we could rewind the tape, but that doesn't matter. Either way, I'm just curious what it's like in that thing, because I mean, you could see in the in the video. I mean, the steering is just just completely live. But everything I've ever seen of that car, steering is just nonstop talk talkative. That, by the way, was the most surprising thing in the T fifty video with Gordon Murray. If you go back and watch it, was he's just driving at like 30, 40, 50 miles an hour on what looks like an airfield, like you know, straight flat. That wheel is doing this in his hand, and I'm like, oh, they have solved the electric power steering thing because I think it's got a clutch that decouples the motor from the from the rack and it's the actual it's the drag of the motor on the rack that is what filters out so much steering um feel on all the on the electric power steering cars Mm. and as soon as you're not moving i i believe i remember reading years ago when this project was first announced that he was going to decouple the motor physically decouple the motor so there's no drag on the steering um that's a good idea i think that's you can add you can retrofit electric power steering to some vintage cars and i think Mm -hmm. that they do the same thing yep they decouple uh at 25 miles an hour Mm -hmm. or whatever it is um it rides really well that's the other thing to to note about the car the 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 responsiveness of the engine is overwhelming like it's truly wild the the way the car responds like you you pin the throttle at 2000 rpm in any gear and the way that the thing reacts and leaps forward it the, and that's what you get with lightness it's like a motorcycle in that sense right the way that the entire car reacts to throttle inputs and how instant it is and like when you turn the key off when the engine when you're shutting down the engine just instant zero rpm and it's like it's jarring it's like when you're used to incandescent light bulbs and you don't realize that when you turn off an led light bulb for the first time and it just goes dark instantly in a, in a mm. flash you're like wow that's really stark it's really noticeable how suddenly it's just silent um so the, the that character of the engine is just like magnificent and it works both when the engine is like running and when you are giving throttle inputs uh, it's and it makes it all the more brutal. I mean, the car's already very powerful and fast, uh, but because it happens so suddenly when you do throttle inputs, it just heightens that that sensation, which requires, of course, a lot of smoothness and sensitivity from the driver, so you don't upset it under power. I, the T fifty is going to be outrageous because so Gordon had a yes, the that, number of a... the, uh, thousands of RPM per second as a right. measure of throttle response. Which I exactly. love that he's come up with a measure for throttle response. Who would do such a thing? But in like, I think the F one was like eight thousand, and he wanted eleven for this, and got forty three or something. Like yeah, so, I remember I watched the video, and they were like, it was like an second. order of magnitude where he's like, the McLaren F one is this. I wanted this. They gave me that. Yeah. Same thing happened with the red line too. He was like, he was like, it needed to have a red line that was higher. The the T fifty needed to have a red line that was higher than, I forget what it was, but it was something else. Uh, and uh, he was looking. I, I think it. it like they 10 got or something. An, another 1,000 RPM or 500 RPM on top of that. They were like, how's 12,100 sound? That's Great. so cool. And I, people, people ask all the time, what's the big deal with revs? And look, there's from a science perspective, not really. You can sort of engineer around a, an engine that doesn't have rev. The only real difference you get is the, the amount of multiples of idle speed. So, you know, a diesel that only revs to 3,500, or like, you know, the big diesels that only rev to 2,000 RPM, They'll idle at 500. They, 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 I mean, they can rev to like 2,500, the big V8 diesels, but they're out of, out of juice at two grand. So from 500 to 2,000, you have a four times multiple of speed in each gear. 
So when you see like the big Peterbilts on the road, they're rawr, 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 right? they just don't have that range to, to, to go that much quickly. If this thing idles at a thousand, it has, you know, 11 or 12 times um, the, its idle speed. And that functionally is a difference as a driver, right? You have these long, um, these long windups, which is exciting. There's just something stupidly juvenilely, childishly Especially exciting. if you have a power curve where it's not flat the whole time because mm-hmm. the higher the revs are, the more shove you get. Uh, yeah. Although the F one is not short on on torque download, right? Because the the that what the characteristic I just described is peakiness, basically, right. which is no power, no power, and you have to rev the piss out of it. Then it makes all this power. The F one is not like that because it has so much torque down low, which is a result, I'm sure, of Vanos and displacement and whatever else. Oh, yeah. Just good uh, engineering. Yeah, so the car has a ton of torque down low. So that's why I was saying you put at 2,000 RPM because the car is light and because it has, I think it's 400 foot pounds of torque at 2,000 RPM, the thing just absolutely rips no matter what engine speed you're at and then it just keeps ripping until you get to you know 7500 or whatever wherever the red line is i think 75 7600 in the mm. f1 uh and that is amazing because you're having your cake and eating it too you're both getting the response and the oomph down low but then like the power keeps climbing as the revs climb and so you just get this like sensational experience as you head towards the red line and you look at the power curves in lesser cars and you're just like oh this is going to be a slog, right? The absence of torque at 2000 RPM means the thing is going to be sort of useless if it's like an old fashioned sports car. Mm-hmm. Uh, or And that's like one of the big things about the 991.2 GT3 is they're like, oh, it has a lot of torque down low, like the mid range. People always talk about mid range. That's why it matters because it gives you this oomph in right. real world Everywhere. situations where you're on the highway at, you know, 2400 RPM and you'd like to do something. Uh, it's amazing. I did uh, a thing years ago with the GM G, General Motors 3.6 liter V6, which is actually a really, really nice V6. Um, and General it's got Motors 3.6. So a, like Camaro, this was like 2008, nine Camaro when it came out had 3.6 liter V6. The, it was the 300 yeah. horsepower thing. And that has the most wonderfully flat torque curve. A GM did an incredible job at just, I think torque almost, I think peaks at like 3,400 or something. But it's at 95% of its output by 2000. And there's this beautiful, absolutely perfect, gorgeous plateau of torque from basically just off idle to, you know, to like 4,800 or 5,000 RPM. Then it just starts to fade, fade off slightly. Brilliant. The problem is when you have that situation, you don't have the build. And it's always that build. You sort of like, I think all great engines have that shove in the ass. Um, you know, somewhere around two thirds of their of their max scale. You know, it'll it'll start to build plateau and then build again, and you get this rush to red line. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so it's funny when you think that the correct thing to do for engineering is to have peak torque from you know from idle to red line if you could, which you're not going to be able to. But two thousand to five thousand would be great, and ultimately that's a little bit of a letdown. Um, and that, I've, again, not driven a McLaren F1. I don't think I've ever seen the power curves. But that engine was based on two S50B32s, was it not? Um, it's e- kind of a clean sheet. It, has, it shares the bore spacing with the M70. Um, right. But I think basically nothing else. Yeah, and I think, but I think the heads were S50, the sort of original Vanos E36 Euro, uh, E36 Euro motor. Um, and the way those Vanos units worked, they, those, those, that six cylinder had this incredible build. Great torque down low, and then a build as you got to like 4,500 and 5,000. Yeah, so the torque is, it, like I said, it's like 400 from down low, and then I think it peaks at 480-ish. Right. Um, and so you get a supplement of some amount that's 20%, I guess. Yeah, and that's 400. 80, 80 um, pound-feet of torque is something you will definitely feel in a 2,500-pound car. <laughs> yeah, but they've also done the nice thing of giving you so much torque down low. Right. Um, that the baseline that you're starting from is 400, which is, you know, exactly what you would want if you were right. to just describe your ideal uh, naturally aspirated engine. But probably couldn't be any more different than the Aveyron experience, which, I mean, in theory has a torque peak from idle to redline. It's turbo. But you're going to have to wait for those four turbos to spool. Yeah, and the the Veyron is so sort of civilized and serious. It's so German in the way that it goes fast, whereas the McLaren is this really alive, you know, like you're talking about the steering wheel dancing in your hand. You would never have a Veyron do something like that. You can make it agile, 
uh, like they did with the Super Sport. He, like did, it, did, right. Did you drive the Super Sport? I did, yes. It was the, so it was the 1200 horsepower. Because that, that one I thought actually had really nice steering. It, was it does have nice steering. Yeah. It just doesn't, like, oh, it's man, not like an old car. 9. I mean, my baseline, right? So when you're saying those, the new McLarens have great steering, it's like maybe compared to other stuff, but compared to like a, a vintage 911 remains f- for me, for always, the benchmark in terms of steering feedback. Because they're so light in the front end that the steering, like, and people find it annoying. Maybe I don't because I'm used to it. The, Anyone the who the finds steering... that annoying should be sentenced to drive a Prius for the rest of eternity. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I my mean, benchmark is the Lotus. At yeah, my lease. Same. And uh, you get this just motion, and like you relax your grip on the steering wheel, and you let the steering do its thing, and it doesn't really change the trajectory of the car. But it, there's st- the steering wheel is if your grip is relaxed enough, is moving, and physically you, dancing, it, and it's yeah. yeah, and it's telling you stuff. And so when I don't have that. I, I don't. I. I like. I said. I get a little bit anxious because I don't. I don't know what's going on. I'm spoiled by the amount of feedback that I'm. I'm getting in other. You know situations. what's shocking is uh, audience. I borrowed Derek's E500, technically 500e, um, 124 uh, E500, uh, and I just could not believe the amount of on center feel. And th- this this occurs to me all the time that you know people are like, you're stuck in old car land, Camisa. Blah 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 blah. If Anybody tells you a modern insert name of something with electric power steering is incredibly talkative. Um, there are very few exceptions to this. They're fucking wrong. And it's because they don't have the benchmark palette cleanser. Um, that E500 doesn't even have a steering rack. It's a yeah, it's recirculating a box. ball box, which yeah. is a recipe for horrible steering. And I guarantee you there is no car in production today that has steering as talkative as your 500Es. Um, yeah. And that was with, just a car at the time. It wasn't even I, like an, a, a sports car or a driver's right. car in terms of steering intention. I mean, there was, I did read 200,000 pages on that book, uh, of books and magazines on that car. And people did talk about how quick the steering was. And it was very talkative and very live, which is something we never associate with Mercedes. But they typically well, yeah, especially did Especially 124s. Right. Yeah, 124s, 201s. People never talked about the steering. I'm sorry. The steering on those cars was magnificent. Um, but... You know, especially looking back now, um, they we have just moved so far away from this information flow from from front wheels to, to driver that we're talking shades of gray. I mean, the best E-Pass cars right now, 911 GT3 um, is really good. Uh, 9, I haven't driven 992 yet, obviously, but uh, 991.2 was really, really close to a, a nice hydraulic system. But you get out of a 991 and get into a McLaren, like I haven't driven a 720 but like i think my favorite of all of them was a 570 and oh my god like the thing is alive i still don't know where how it would compare to your like that 500e i think 500e might have actually even have more on center field in the case of your car you have wider wheels on it so it's it's also tram lining a bit but like physically you take your hand off the wheel and it does this it's just kind of doing this the whole time you're driving oh man i missed that I miss that. And so the idea of, I think the reason that I have such a boner for the, for the F1 is the idea that you can have their own speeds, that noise, and it's the intake that we know so well from all the videos that we watched, um, the build quality, all the center seating, like this whole special experience with steering that's better than Elise. Like it's just better than the, you take every benchmark and that car is better than the benchmark in every single way. Except I mean, even the package. Air yeah. <laughs> yes, and bricks. Those are the and and headlights. Those are the three bricks. most commonly upgraded things on those cars. Well, so what happened was, I think this is a pretty well known anecdote. Was that is in this order a what to, had happened was moment? <laughs> <laughs> that what they had to do was the brakes had to behave. They had to be able to hold up to, uh, basically full pedal force stops from I think it was eighty or ninety percent of the car's V max. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was something that applied to all cars sold to the British public. And 80 or 90% of VMAX of a McLaren F1 is rather a lot. And so the brakes were designed to do well in that test, which meant they got rather hot because you'd be starting the test at 200 miles an hour or something like that. Right. Uh, and so the braking compounds that they selected for the car uh, were designed around that test rather than like mm, what would be the ideal solution for, for driving purposes. Uh, mm-hmm. And how often are you going 200 miles an hour? And it's like, if you're going to be doing that, then you should probably use a different, this hard compound. So I think they're pretty hard compounds specifically for that test, which specifies 
not a, a speed that you start at at, but a percentage of VMAX of the car that you start Which the test kind at. of does make sense. You want to make sure the car can stop from its top speed. Yeah, but do you need to do that X times in a row where X is like, I don't know, 10? <laughs> I, I don't know what the actual... When you're on an Autobahn, the thing is, yes, you do. I mean, you know, I had... Uh, years ago, I had a uh, Mark III Volkswagen Golf, um, which came with a 2-liter, two 2-point two slow, 115 horsepower and an automatic. And I swapped a VR in. And it was a Canadian spec uh, VR that, VR6 that we put in it. And so it was limited to 200K, 124 miles an hour. And the first time I hit 124, um, I don't remember what happened, but I needed to slow down in a very dramatic hurry. Um, and down to a stop. I mean, there was like traffic stopped in front of me. And I stopped and all both front wheels burst into flames. Um, by the end of that stop... Wait, you pedal upgraded the, the motor floor. and not the brakes? I hadn't gotten to the brakes yet. I did. I did right after this. But they were... They were Mark III's typically had front discs and then rear drums, but there was a small production batch that had four-wheel discs. So it was like 10.1-inch front discs with rear-wheel discs. I thought everything was fine absolutely not not even close to being fine um and this is a car that could do 110 from i don't even know 112 it was 112 was its maximum speed with the two liter automatic well to go from 112 to 124 that difference was the difference between stopping and not and you could definitely encounter an experience on an autobahn where you know you have someone pull out in front of you you get brakes 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 they're super hot and then someone else pulls out in front of you 30 seconds later and they haven't gotten a chance to cool off so I'm all for laws that say your car should be able to stop even after you've doubled the factory power. But, you know, um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so that's one so of they the, do the points of frequent upgradage on those cars. They tried to do ceramic brakes, but they just couldn't get them to work reliably under the full spectrum of driving conditions enough. So that was probably the one thing they set out to do that they couldn't on that car was ceramic brakes. Because they had pioneered, McLaren had pioneered ceramic brakes in F1 cars, and they were getting mm-hmm. them to work in racing because you're using them full force at high temps all the time. And right. they just they couldn't get them to work when they were cold was yeah. the problem in the F1. We're finally just getting there now, where ceramic, I think you know, fifth generation of ceramic brakes actually work well when they're cold. Um, yeah. That was a problem with the early Ferrari stuff too. Yeah. So AC doesn't work super great. That's commonly upgraded. I think our car actually has factory upgraded AC. Uh, the headlights got upgraded and the, the or would be a frequently upgraded and the brakes. Those are probably the three mm. most common upgrade points for the F1s. Interesting. Um, I was in... Oh, we I were talking a... about Veyron versus right. F1. That's where... Well, this... here's another one. Let me bring up Porsche 959 for a second, which is a car that interests me zero. I, I just, you know, do not, I've always thought it was ugly as sin. I think it f- beautifully foretold everything, predicted the, the, everything that would go wrong in the automotive world in the future. Computer controlled everything, turbocharged, boring, blah, 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 blah. However, uh, four wheel drive. I did get, yeah, I did get a it's ride. One of the most one. never meet your heroes cars ever for me. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it was so boring? Yeah. Uh, hmm. I'm a big Porsche enthusiast, obviously. And I was so excited the first time I was going to drive a 959, and I drove it, and I was like, Mirror. I mm. was just like, I don't know, it feels like a 993 Turbo, which See, I don't I particularly g- like. I'm not, I'm, I don't like four-wheel drive 911s, uh, and so, I mean, I should have calibrated my expectations. The The thing was that it but blew it's everybody's a mind. But it's nine, right? I, mean, I, know, it's but the... it, I know, it blew everyone's mind because it was the future, but, like, it was not the future, the future we wanted. Wrong direction. Not, the, yeah. not the future I wanted. <laughs> Uh, so I was I was really bummed when I drove 959 the first time. I got a ride in one driven by Bruce Canepa. Um And there are not too many people that I say are completely clinically insane and should be jailed um, <laughs> on public roads. I, I'm totally kidding. Uh, the man is one hell of a driver and gave me one hell of a ride. Well, he also has um, the upgraded ones that have like, like 200, yeah. 1,000. So I not 200 more close. than original. Because originally they were 450. Miles. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. Um, you put a thousand horsepower on anything; it's going to be. Uh... It wasn't that. It wasn't the power. It was <laughs> what he did with the power. I mean, he the amount of lag. So I could see, you know, nine eleven don't have that transmission tunnel. So as a passenger, you can see the feet very clearly, um, and I could see him apply throttle miles <laughs> before he ever needed it. Um, but he, you know, he's so intimately aware of what this car does um, that he flung it sideways into a, like a 180 degree on-ramp um, to get on the freeway 
and he Scandi flicked it under full braking while also at full throttle and let the car rotate around, 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 and the boost hit right at the right spot, lit up all four, and then transferred, because it's computer control, transferred just enough forward to hold that drift, and it was the singular most oh-my-God moment I've ever felt. Um, and then it was just all over at what sounded like 3,000 RPM. And then he did it again. And it just, do another, you know, do another run to red line, another run to red line. And I thought, God damn it. Like, this is, this is so German to say, if he makes the fastest car in the world, and have it just sound like, eh, eh, like, it just, no, turbocharged, all turbocharged 911 suck. I'm, I'm gonna yeah. catch so much shit. Yeah, that. and there's all these people who are like turbo only, and I'm like, I don't. You, you I did this. I bought one because I was like turbo, you know. And then I had it for 18 months, and I put 500 miles on it because I hated <gasps> driving it. <laughs> oh my god! Wow, I can't believe you kept it that long. If you know, if you didn't ever drive it, that's two tanks of gas. I mean, I spent a fair amount of time trying to sort it out. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, the other every... problem with vintage turbo is because it's CIS. Uh, and oh. so, like, warm-up <laughs> regulators, and the thing never ran that great. And, and that's why they're always modified, because the the constraints of the time made it so that they didn't it really work that well It doesn't well matter. People who buy 997 turbos, every single time somebody buys one, I, I'm not nice to anyone at this point. Like, I'm trying to save my friends from a mistake. And, you know, 996, 997 turbo, oh, the speed, the speed, the speed, the speed. I'm like, it sounds like a helicopter running out of fuel. It does It's just... <laughs> got horrendous like oh it's got variable turbine geometry i'm like yeah all the journalists who don't know what the fuck that means said oh the car's got no lag back in the day you're wrong it's horrible lag they sound like nothing they're quick you're much better off i would rather have if they had made a two liter yeah even worse so it numbs all the steering you can't get it sideways i mean you can't chassis is good on the cars but um everyone i know that's ever bought one has sold it fairly quickly they've either boosted it to a thousand horsepower uh, because then it becomes fun by virtue of the just Risk ridiculous of death. speed. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the Senna. The Senna is fun because you feel like you could die. I drove, I, I did that video. I did the spotlight video on that Senna and I barely drove that car. Um, I drove, you know, a couple miles was all I had time to do, but I was, it was awake. Uh, it was a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> oh, but the reason that I brought up the 959 actually was because uh, I remember Bruce Canepo, this fucking amazing driver, right, telling me every Every beautiful drift in the in the 959 is 15 scary spins in the F1. He thought that car was completely unmanageable and unhand, you know, like couldn't handle, did, just didn't handle well. Um, did you talk to owner of said dude? Like, because the guy was lighting him up. I mean, you don't normally get to see a mid-engine car just completely fucking incinerating its tires under full acceleration and didn't look like he was having any trouble controlling it. I mean, he has some vintage F1 cars and Can-Am cars with like a thousand horsepower that weigh, you know, thousand pounds. Or I don't know how much a Can-Am car weighs, but it's probably nothing. Uh, so I think he has fast hands. Wow. That was so, it was cool. The only time I've ever seen anyone drive an F1 like that was the Tiff Nadell Top Gear video. Yes. Which was what got me yes. in this business. I mean, that was the one that made me want to uh, wanna tell stories on video. Golden Murray doesn't listen. To the radio. <laughs> Tiff Nadell's delivery was always amazing. Yeah. The engine yeah. compartment's lined with gold. Because gold is the best heat reflector. I mean, he was just, Tiff's delivery, man. <laughs> He's a hero. Yeah. So, um, that's very typical, that left foot braking thing. I mean, because you just want to start boosting. And you want to w- get the lag to have disp- disappeared by the time you like to be off the brakes. So you you are braking at the same time that you're throttling and that that works in a car with enough power but in a 930 that doesn't work because of the gearing disadvantage and i think that it just doesn't have enough power to overcome (laughs) the brakes because the thing has a six and a half to one compression ratio so when you get on the brakes and you're on the throttle at the same time it just slows down (laughs) (laughs) it stalls Uh, yeah is it really six and a half to one yes the the 930s have six and a half to one compression ratio so they're absolutely gutless off boost yeah. uh and it's always off boost because it's got a four speed with really tall gearing it's just a stupid stupid car fucking porsche with the tall gearing man it's like it's just one of the, you know that somewhere in in sofenhausen on the wall is like list of 911 characteristics like you know evil handling ass engine motherfucker check 
gears that are so stupidly long that Americans get one shift and go to jail. Check. Just, you know, that I know what they was true of the 930. Uh, it was not true of uh, five-speed 911s until the probably the 90s. Did we get different gearing than the rest of the world? Did the U.S.? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, look, the, the, the reality is very simple. When you're tuning a car for its top speed, you can plug in, you know, let's say the car makes 300 horsepower. You know that that given the aerodynamic drag and the, and, the, and the tire drag of that car, exactly how fast 300 horsepower will get you. Let's say that is 164 miles an hour. Well, you take fifth gear to get you to 164 miles an hour at the horsepower peak, and then you've geared the car properly for its top speed. Then you have to just slice up the remaining uh, four gears on a five-speed in evenly spaced intervals or whatever. And you know, for, in the case of first gear, it has to be low enough that the car can get going on a 20% grade, um, but then tall enough that... And the problem that we have now is all emissions and noise regulations. So off the record, I was told by a bunch of people at Porsche that the reason that the 911R and the GT3 Touring and all those cars um, are geared the way... And, it was actually a Cayman. Um, it was a uh, Boxer Spider, Cayman GT4 Boxer Spider. Uh, the reason that is done is a drive-by noise test that California, of all annoying places, mandates. Um, you need to have a certain gear ratio because you have to start. It's a box. You enter the box at certain speed, and then you full throttle accelerate in third gear until the end, and you're measuring your noise throughout that. Uh, throughout that area and obviously the faster you go the more tire noise you have and the more wind noise that you have so the less engine noise you can you can make which is why the current uh, six-speed gt car porsches are all geared so tall is because third is mandated by california law top gear sixth gear is going to be mandated by the car's search for top speed so you have two points and first obviously there are going to be drive-by regulations that are going to influence first and also drivability issues that are going to influence first. Um, so their hands are tied. They can't put short third gears in these cars. So my response was, why don't you just lay, put a seven speed in and label one like Granny Galenda. or G Galenda or something. Galenda, right? yeah. Um, like they did the 959. Yeah. That is perhaps the coolest feature of the 959 is that it's, instead of the gears being labeled one through six, they're labeled G one through five. Right. G for uh, Galenda, which means terrain. off-road, basically terrain, yeah. Um, or granny gear, as we call yeah. it. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I've dri- like an old Ford pickup truck that I drove. It was an inline six, and you would start in second instead of first, even though it only was a four speed. Uh, and it was a, basically a three speed mm-hmm. pattern with a fourth granny gear added if you needed it to if, if you, you were towing to or going up down. terrain, yeah. Yeah. yeah, or something like that. It was like a cheap low range. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I kind of hope that Porsche can can figure that. Look, we only got a couple years left before these things are all outlawed anyway. Let's have a little bit of fun. Come up with a way to cheat. I mean, if the German, I'm not going to. Car companies are all over okay. the world are really, stop it. Why would you insinuate that, Derek? No, car companies all over Why the world are Why isn't Audi at Le Mans anymore? I, what? A, <laughs> diesel. What? I just sneezed and diesel exhaust fluid came out. No, I mean, car companies are always very good at finding clever solutions to annoying regulations. And the re- reality is, why the fuck should some Boxster Spider be limited to third gear for this acceleration test? Um, Teslas, by the way, fail European drive by regs because, the they're, basis, so because they're so fast. damn fast. Right. Yeah. That by the end of the box, even without an engine, they're still making too much noise. I mean, this is the kind of bullshit that. We need drive-by regulations. We need emissions regulations, blah, 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 blah. But when you get bad rules that are written so poorly, like here's a car with a thousand horsepower that GTR, like GTR, we've talked about this on the podcast before, like GTR cannot downshift. If you floor it, I think it's a 28 miles an hour. It puts a two second delay in or it would be going too fast to pass in at the drive-by test. Like, okay, test is flawed. Come up with a new test because we want our fucking thousand horsepower GTRs, bitches. (laughs) Amen to that. Well, I mean, um, I'm not a GTR enthusiast, but conceptually, I would like someone who is a GTR enthusiast to have their car. The, all I got to say is that Gordon Murray car better not be, you know, better not do 241 miles an hour in third gear because of some stupid California drive-by regulation. I mean, I just basically don't care. I would drive it anyway. I just don't care. That's, yeah, I'm very excited for that car. Yeah, we just did a, um, 
uh, second in the Haggerty Jason Kamis on the Icons um, video series, and it's on Mustang Mach E. And uh, I talk about how once you remove the screaming, dramatic internal combustion engine, you know, handling is kind of important because there's no, you know, no drama. And without drama, the electric cars just don't sell. And I basically say that's why everyone is touching themselves inappropriately about the T50. And of course, it was one of the crew, it was my director's idea. Like, oh, as soon as you say that, somebody should hand you a, uh, a box of tissues and <laughs> a bottle of lotion. lotion. And I just, I just, we're just watching the, the editor just sent me over the rough cut. And I'm like, this is so, <laughs> I'm going to have to apologize to so many people over this. Wildly inappropriate. <laughs> it is wildly inappropriate, but everyone is touching themselves inappropriately or not uh, about the T. I'm, I am not touching myself inappropriately, but I'm dr- ruling over this T50 and the F1 in a way that I have not ruled over practically any other modern car, uh, with the exception of an Aston V12 vintage S manual seven speed. Yeah, I mean, what I, what I ultimately concluded, and I put this in the video, was that th- there are so few compromises that it feels like it's not real or that it's not possible. That you should get something that rides like this, that for some reason is the same size as a Porsche Boxster, but weighs 700 pounds less, that holds 50% more people and luggage and sounds like sex and is one of the f- like most insane performing cars of all time. All of that in one car? Like, how is that possible and wh- why is it so hard... For other cars to even get close. I mean, they lack the genius, obviously, of the team that put the F1 together and the open checkbook and the the clean sheet to do it. And that's what makes that car so special. And that's why I think they're worth so much, that coupled with the rarity. But And that's what I was talking about when I said there's no substitute in the sense that there's no car at any other price point that you can buy, period, that that brings all of that compelling value proposition and so few of those compromises together into one car. It just doesn't exist. And that's why I think so many people are so into the F1 and why they're so valuable. I, it makes perfect sense. I would, if I had the money, I would have one and I'd have a T50 on order right now. Yeah. And anyone and who likes driving should do the same. I can't imagine anyone, I can't imagine any other car that I would spend that kind of money on. I mean, what were they, $18 million, $20 million for an F1? Yeah, it depends on the mileage and configuration. But yeah, I mean, I would say the... The most terrible one in the world is probably worth sixteen million or something. That's amazing. Like, and the fact that you would sit there in your hovel in, 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 in basement apartment. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. The fact that you any any normal human being who does not have hundreds of billions of dollars in the bank would say it's worth it to a car that costs fifteen to thirty million dollars is insane. But I'd sell my, one of my Volkswagen for one. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! So that's the ultimate. Uh, We've wrapped the ultimate the beginning. See, so I said one of the Volkswagens would probably be the E Golf because the McLaren won't leak. <laughs> what am I kidding? It's a German engine. <laughs> yeah. Well, there we have it. Best car ever made. Best sports it's car. It's the built. epitome. Uh, yeah, I mean, until the next one comes along, which is. On the horizon. Yeah, from I can't wait. No one else but him, but Gordon Murray. Yeah. Back to our episode about how all amazing cars are designed, engineered, and you know, spearheaded by one person who really gets it. I don't know if we did that episode or just talked about it, but we've talked about this all the time. It always comes down to one, one person who just gets it. Yeah, and you have to give them a long enough leash to bu- build what they want to build, in a, mm-hmm. as opposed to impl- imposing all these external constraints. I mean, we've talked about this in the context of 911R. Mm-hmm. The, the 991 911R. I mean, it, or Colin Chapman, or you know, whenever. Right. It, but it's always great to give them long enough money and enough talented engineers to make the vision a reality. Yep. And it has to be the right person. I mean, you know, not the oh, person yes. who wanted the Nissan Murano cross cabriolet. Oh, you're gonna have all the money in the world to do that? No. I think those are gonna be collectible. You've, we've talked about this, right? Like Aztecs. Like it's just this weird. In the same way that an Amphicar is. You're like, it's so bad, it's good. And it's yeah. singular. And it has identity. I hate to agree with you, but you're totally right. I mean, they sold so few of them that... They're, they're, we've we talked about that. Scarcity being the number one factor in the collectability Correct. of a car. So when you're assembling your vehicular investment portfolio, we are extremely high on recommending both the McLaren F1 and the Murano Crosscap. <laughs> Preferably in matching colors. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> 
Tune in next time for more smart buying gifts on the Carmudgeon Show. <laughs>